This week on The Communicators, a conversation with the new president of the National Association of Broadcasters, former Oregon Senator Gordon Smith. Our guest this week on The Communicators is Gordon Smith, the new president and CEO of the National Association of Broadcasters, a familiar face to C-SPAN viewers. Senator Smith uh, served in the United States Senate from 1996 to 2008, and he was on the Commerce Committee during that time, which is very much involved in telecommunications policy. Our guest reporter this week, John Egerton, who is the Washington Bureau Chief of Broadcasting and Cable Magazine. Thanks to both of you for being here. Thank you. Senator, I, I want to start really n not so much with telecommunications, but uh, with the Supreme Court decision this yes. week. Uh, and I'm going to ask you what their ruling on campaign finance means for your members. Well, I, I probably should just admit I never voted for McCain-Feingold, so I actually think it's a good decision um, for, for freedom of speech, but you know, ultimately you can't get on TV or radio uh, without paying for it. Um, broadcasters have lots of costs in production of content, and um, you know, the American people rely on their TV and radios, and um, ultimately I, I suspect it means uh, there'll be more political advertising. Um, but I think that the best part of the ruling was full disclosure, and I think the more that's disclosed, the American people can make a judgment as to who is for whom and why, and an informed citizenry is the best. But I, um, I think it does help in terms of at a time when advertising is down, perhaps <laughs> political advertising will go up. John and I are going to ask you lots of detailed questions about policy and, and uh, current debates in Washington, but before we get into the nuts and bolts, I'd like to have you talk to us about what you see your members' business looking like 10 years from now. I actually am very optimistic about um, broadcasting's future, both in the radio side and in terms of high-definition radio taking off. I don't know whether satellite radio will continue flatlining or whether it will grow, but I think uh, people love their radios. And uh, it's just a, a ubiquitous part of being an American is having a radio handy for news, entertainment, sports, politics, um, and certainly emergency services. Um, in terms of television, I think uh, the digital transition has uh, reawakened a future for TV broadcasting. Uh, with uh, digital television, you get a better picture. You got 3D coming soon. Um, and you will find what's called multicasting with stations now able to offer uh, unique channels, um, perhaps children's channels, um, uh, sports channels, weather channels, in addition to their traditional broadcast signal. Uh, this just means more opportunities for the public. If they want to get it the old-fashioned way, they can get it for free right over the uh, public airwaves. Yeah. Well, to get to that... Uh, 10-year window, uh, you have to have spectrum. And spectrum reclamation is the elephant in the room in any discussion uh, about broadcasting these days. Can you briefly explain the issue and why you are so concerned about it? Well, the, the spectrum for your viewers is basically the highways of the, of the airwaves. Um, and it's the way the federal communication uh, organizes the, you know signals so that there's not interference from one channel to another and in the in an age where people are becoming very hooked to their blackberries and their iPhones and I have one of each and I love them um, and with laptops and the, the demand for Wi-Fi space it will in coming years crowd spectrum uh, for example, when President Obama was inaugurated, people were using their, their cell phones to communicate and to participate, and it crashed the, the system. Um, these are what's known as one-to-one -one kinds of uses of spectrum. They're spectrum-hogging devices. Broadcasting, conversely, uses its spectrum and has historically to provide a one-to-many kind of distribution of information, politics, entertainment, music, all of those things. Um, the proposal now is so that every American can have Wi-Fi broadband is to take spectrum from broadcasting or from the federal government or from some areas that are not fully utilized. Broadcasters oppose surrendering their spectrum because in a digital age we're using it more efficiently, but we do have a, a high-definition signal now that people are really enjoying. 
we do have multicasting, which will, which will expand. And in the future, broadcasting will, will provide to your mobile phone your local television station. These are mobile television. All of these things will require the use of the spectrum that broadcasters have. In addition to all of that, um, in making the transition from analog to digital, I was on the Commerce Committee when we appropriated $2 billion to help people get the little boxes, the new antennas, so they could get the digital sig signal. Um, I know our industry spent about $15 billion in new equipment to go digital. The American people in the, in the tens of millions went out and bought digital TVs. If they take broadcast spectrum, and some of the trial balloon proposals are to stack TV stations in a way that will ultimately destroy the high definition broadcast signal. It would take away the multi-channel availability. It would eliminate the future of mobile TV. We just think that, uh, that, that in the digital TV shouldn't be sacrificed on the altar of the digital divide. Well, have you made that case to the FCC? Because I talked to their top staffer in terms of these scenarios last week, and he said that the most extreme case was off the table, basically mandatorily taking it back or pushing HD out. So is there some middle ground that you can find with the FCC? Uh, there, I mean, we are open to discussing this and to looking at it and, uh, and to utilizing the spectrum efficiently, and nobody uses it more efficiently than broadcasting. But I don't know their, until I see their proposal, I, I've got a moving target. I don't know what I'm trying to kick the ball over or, or, or trying to, what end zone I'm trying to avoid. Uh, we're not saying no blanketly. We're just saying let us see the proposal and we'll try to calculate it. The problem, however, is that um, these are not straight lines in spectrum. They're, it's sort of a blanket quilt of how it's utilized from community to community. And so when you say, let's take it back or turn it in, um, I don't know fully how that translates or whether or not um, we could share the space because the technology broadcasters use is not compatible with the digital technology that um, that one-to-one -one kinds of devices use. So I, I, until I see their proposal, I don't know whether it's technologically feasible. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I, while you're speaking of the FCC, you, you've had a chance uh, from your Senate position to know a number of FCC chairs and look at them philosophically. When you look at this FCC, what do you see? What? Oh, I, I'm, I've always enjoyed working with uh, FCC commissioners from both parties, and we're certainly willing to work with Chairman Jenikowski and the current members. I know them all. They're wonderful and decent people. Sure, but what direction do you see them heading? I see them. Uh, trying to think forwardly and figure out how to provide Wi-Fi universally to everyone. Um, and I don't disagree with that objective. What I would disagree with is if it becomes so activist that they simply sacrifice TV for the sake of a mobile phone. Um, I love my mobile phones, but I, I, we all need our TVs for information, entertainment, news, sports, emergency services. It's a pretty important feature in American life and I think it, ha it ought to have a bright future and I don't after all the billions have been spent I think it would be politically impossible for them to sell on Capitol Hill a proposal that says well even though you detrimentally re relied upon the digital transition never mind I don't I don't think that that is a, a proposal that has much promise Retransmission consent is another issue that got a lot of publicity over the holidays, particularly with some people fearing they were going to lose their bowl games. Can you talk a little bit about it and whether you think there's something broken that needs fixing? Well, I think what, what, what's happening is you're watching the marketplace work. And uh, there have been thousands of retransmission uh, consents arrived at um, uh, in the marketplace, and that's how it ought to operate. I would simply point out that when you look at cable content produced, for example, by Time Warner, um, they, they charge their cable operators one pocket to another dramatically more than they pay broadcasters for their content. And when you look at what are people watching, 
while we all have cables, I suspect, most of us get through retransmission on our cable system, we're watching broadcast content. And they pay dramatically less for broadcasting content than they do for their own cable content. So if you want to make them equal, well, that's good for broadcasters. Um, so, you know, ultimately we think that the, the marketplace is working and uh, it's very important for the future of television uh, networks uh, and their affiliates to be able to have retransmission dollars so that they can have uh, good journalism in their newsroom and provide local content, localism, which provides uh, programming that makes every American community a community. Well, uh, as a follow-up to that, there was a... The FCC launched an inquiry, not an inquiry, an, an initiative into the future of media and journalism. And the chairman said this, and I'm quoting him, rapid technological change in the media marketplace has created opportunities for tremendous innovation. It has also caused financial turmoil for traditional media, calling into question whether these media outlets will continue to play their historic role in providing local communities with essential news and civic information. Is he right? Yeah, I mean, you know, with the very best of intentions, sometimes government regulates in a way that has unintended consequences and becomes counterproductive. And, you know, they had ownership caps and they had vertical ownership prohibitions. Um, and, and ultimately, I think what people are beginning to realize is that legitimate journalism, good investigative journalism, it costs money. And if you have one news center here in a newspaper, another in a radio station, another in a TV station, they are all suffering with the dispersal of information over so many media, traditional media and new media over the internet and the blogosphere, that they're simply failing financially. My point is simply, perhaps we ought to relook at some of this and simply say there are economies of scale that newspapers, radio, and television could en enjoy together. That means um, perhaps some relaxation of ownership rules. Um, or provide, allowing some uh, vertical integration uh, in, in communities. Um, it's just one idea. I'm not necessarily advocating it, but I am saying that that is a better option than the federal government subsidizing newspapers when newspapers are supposed to be the watchdog of government. Well, wouldn't you advocate for loosening duopoly rules or getting rid of the ban on newspaper broadcast cross ownership? I, I think that that makes a, a lot of sense. Um, and, uh, you know, some of our members, our affiliates don't like some of this, and some of them do, but I'm simply pointing out the obvious that good journalism costs money. And if you fracture it so much between different outlets that it can't come together to have the necessary financing to produce what we need, to have a, you know, the, the fifth estate of the media watching government being the watchdog for the American people, we won't have as vigorous um, a, a media as we have in the past. Well, we're talking about content. Uh, we recently have seen another federal trial on indecency standards. Mm. From a philosophical perspective, excuse me, um, indecency overall, I mean, what's the right position for this? I mean, where are we going as a country with the kind of content we provide? You keep talking about how dispersed the information yeah. sources are. So well, you, how do you get it right? Broadcasting is in a unique place. Broadcasting is a free service. But most of your viewers don't know whether they're watching a broadcast channel or a cable channel. Cable channels are subscription channels, and you can get anything you want, any obscenity even that you may or seen to the viewer or the indecent, you can get that anything you want on a cable subscription service. But when it comes to broadcasting, we have stewardship over the public airwaves. And with the public airwaves, there are public responsibilities not to offend local community standards. Uh, there are fleeting expletives, there are you know, things which are said, wardrobe malfunctions. There are technological functions to these hiccups in our in, in broadcasting. There's the V-chip, there's a rating system, there's five-second delays where you can dump stuff or bleep things. Uh, I would suggest that that is a better way to manage this than, uh, than to regulate to the point where um, broadcasters just are unduly muzzled. But I would point out we're not, in, we're not pushing obscenity because 
under the rules now, if broadcasters wanted to be obscene, they could be after 10 p.m. But you don't see Letterman trying to be obscene um, or Leno. Uh, they, they, they still hew to, uh, to humor, hopefully without the obscenity. And uh, that's the indecency, rather. And so um, broadcasters uh, understand their responsibility. Uh, at the same point, uh, we do value our freedom of speech. But a number of broadcasters want this to go back to the Supreme Court on the First Amendment issues and suggest that it is community standards, but it should be broadcasters and the community, not broadcasters and the community and the FCC. I, uh, John, I acknowledge that some do want that, and I'm, um, some of my friends are for it, and some of them are against it, and I'm with my friends. <laughs> How's that for a political answer? <laughs> um, the, the truth is there's a range of feelings within the National Association of Broadcasters on this. My, just speaking as a dad, I just assumed there wasn't obscenity over the public airwaves, um, or, or indecency, rather. Obscenity is a, and decency are different terms. But looking at it from a, from a business perspective, since all of your competitors, mm -hmm. the ones that you have to compete against and be competitive in this yeah. multi-channel world, C-SPAN and My Magazine, our websites, cable and satellite, they can all speak to their community yeah. without the FCC there. Doesn't this put you at a competitive disadvantage that you should be trying to level it, the field? It does put us at a competitive disadvantage. Uh, I acknowledge that. And it does, you know, broadcasters want to produce what uh, our constituents, our viewers want to watch. Um, and they have all kinds of of options today that are indecent to obscene. And, um, it, and yet, again, we have the restraint unique to broadcasting that we have a public responsibility. So it is, it is a balancing act that we have to engage in, and I, I hope we do it better than, than not. Not to stay with this, but Moby services are going to be using the public spectrum as well. Yes, they are. And it's, it's going to be a challenge. And, but, you know, ultimately, um, to make it fair, then everything ought to be regulated by the FCC, not just broadcasters. But so can we quote you on that? In, yeah, that I'm just saying, to your point, <laughs> yes, I about a competitive disadvantage. I mean, if you, the playing field isn't level on the issue of indecency. Do you want to talk briefly about the opportunities specifically that there are for keeping your spectrum in terms of not only mo mobile TV and, and, and multicasting particularly, I would say. Well, I think the future is very bright for all of those things. It takes time to ramp these things up and to get the products to market, but I was just at the CES show in Las Vegas, saw some marvelous mobile telephone TV sets. Uh, it, you know, the, tomorrow's here, and uh, these things will be available to the public in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, there's probably a dozen uh, 20 actually uh, channels that you can get on a mobile phone right now and um, I think that as we figure out how to how that expands there'll be advertising opportunities new revenue streams to broadcasting which will be very important to the health of the industry well, our, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, well, our cell phone companies putting the, the, the DTV tuners in their devices now um, I think it's sort of the chicken and the egg um, there are there are phones being produced that have them. Uh, whether they will, it will take off, I think that depends on the, the public uh, awareness of them, their purchase of them. And uh, when one does it and it starts to grow, the others will follow in, in line for competitive reasons. We have nine minutes left. At the outset, you re referred to 3D as one of the bright spots on the horizon. I'm wondering, since we're spending so much time talking about the stresses already, mm -hmm on bandwidth, whether or not you think all of this sudden emergence of 3D as the next great thing is a, is a good thing for us to be promoting and talking about. Oh, I yeah, I do. I mean, it, you know, there will be, um, the NFL has already announced they're going to, I think they said 13 games, they're going to film in three dimension. And it takes some new cameras to do that. But I again, at this uh, show that I saw, all of the manufacturers, Panasonic, Sony, uh, Mitsubishi, I think, uh, Toshiba, they all had 3D products there. Um, and some were better than others, in my, to my view, but they were all dramatic. And for example, we went into the Panasonic booth and um, we saw, 
a football game that had been filmed in 3D. Without the glasses on, it's a tremendous two-dimensional high-definition picture. You put the three-dimension glasses on and you are on the field. I mean, when you see it, you, you can hardly believe that you can have that kind of entertainment um, quality right there in front in your TV. Um, but it is coming, and Avatar is certainly an example where uh, the public is saying, yeah, we're ready to go 3D. And so I suspect that that will, is a, a category uh, in the television business and for broadcasters that will grow dramatically. Does that mean that we're all going to have to go out and buy new TV sets in the next year or two? Well, I think the manufacturers are hoping so. <laughs> uh, let me talk a minute about children's programming, because mm -hmm. uh, the FCC is looking at a wide-ranging review of its, of its uh, children's TV rules. And the chairman said, again this week, that uh, maybe educational informational programming isn't the place uh, uh, broadcasting is in the place for that because their business model is more about aggregating eyeballs. Yeah. Do you agree with that? Well, um, you know, if you have a children's program with somebody in front of a chalkboard, they're not, the kids aren't going to watch that. So you have to intersperse children's entertainment with children's educational in a pretty creative way so you can sell the advertising. I would point out that multicasting does give ne uh, networks an opportunity to provide um, children's programming 24-7 and uh, their uh, ION for example does have a program um, that's 24-7 right now for children um, so there are some that are trying to get ahead of this so it doesn't necessarily need to be regulated but I think it's a real opportunity for us to satisfy a public obligation that we take seriously to children to uh, provide uh, more children's educational programming is there a problem in the backstory to that? And there seems to be a backstory to a lot of what the FCC is talking about that comes down to a point that says, well, broadband is really the future, that maybe the TV set is going to become a broadband monitor because there's that inquiry into whether we change the set tops into basically a broadband and uh, a traditional TV model. Yeah. Is, is there a problem against lobbying against that, particularly since broadband now means health and education and you know, government services. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I have to say when I was in the Congress, most members of Congress, except, unless you're on one of the House or Senate Commerce Committees, the understanding of what broadband means is, is, is fairly surface level. And broadband is sort of a catch-all for the cure to every societal ill. Uh, it isn't that. Uh, ultimately, I think what you will see is some new technologies coming along where broadband and broadcast are blended. For example, uh, I'm not pushing particular companies, but there was this product from a group called Ses Sesme, like Open Sesme, and they blend broadcast and broadband in a way that gets, gets you 200 channels, whatever you got on cable, broadcast, in an antenna that... Um, frankly cuts the price of cable or satellite dramatically in terms of cost and gives you the, the clearest picture which comes from broadcast because it moves over broadcast spectrum. But you talked earlier about how expensive it is to produce that programming. So how do the, how do the economics of that work for the content producer? Well, I, 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 there's obviously a, a company like that is going to pay retransmission fees to cable and to, to broadcasters. Um, they just simply have... Um, uh, by using broadcast spectrum, which is one to many, uh, they can do it at a price that is, uh, is dramatically less than laying a cable or shooting it up to a satellite. So, they, so, so they'll, they'll be leasing some of the broadcast spectrum to do this? Uh, yes, and uh, they are already doing it in, in a number of cities. Uh, I know they are in Los Angeles, and they're just being oversubscribed. So it's, you know, you have to speak to them to sell their program, but... Um, I was really impressed. So maybe the government could adopt the SESME model and lease some of the spectrum for their own. I, I would have to understand more the technology and, and the pot to, to answer uh, the, the possibility of the, that question. For many years uh, in front of your Commerce Committee, uh, broadcasters in the cable industry were uh, friendly adversaries about policy issues. How does a potential Comcast-NBC merger change the game? Um, 
Y you know, the, the Democratic platform was opposed to media consolidation. I assume the Obama administration, therefore, will look at this proposed merger, put lots of caveats and conditions on it, which will not make a discernible difference in terms of how it translates from NBC to its affiliates in relationship to cable. But that's just supposition on my part. Uh, I know the Department of Justice, the FCC, and the FTC are all going to look at this, and what they decide, uh, I, I, can't, I can't fully predict. NAB has not taken a position for it or against it, uh, but rather uh, let's let the process work and let all the parties uh, make their case and ha enjoy due process of law. But your members have expressed some concerns about it, haven't they? So our, so many affiliates have, yes. Uh, because, what, what are those? Well, obviously, if, if, you, if you own a, a, a station in Medford, Oregon, and you're an NBC affiliate, and the potential exists that, that NBC could simply program around your local station, no, well, you could be concerned about that. And so uh, networks and affiliates need each other. And um, my assumption is, is that NBC does continue to care about its local affiliates and wants that local news station um, to follow or precede its national news program. And um, uh, I, I think that that is in the, in the interest of the Peacock and that they'll continue uh, working out an arrangement, even if owned by a cable company, that will preserve those essential features of what we think of as localism and broadcasting. Tom, we've got a minute left. Closing questions? Okay. My closing question is always, what question should I have asked you that you <laughs> wanted to answer when you came here? Well, you, uh, uh, the hot issue, I, we've been talking TV and on the radio side, obviously, is the, the great debate that Congress has had at many times over whether you pay not just the copyright owner of a song, but whether radio stations have to pay the performer as well. Uh, historically, Congress has always backed off of that because they said uh, the, prom the promotional service is the equivalent value of uh, the, the right to play. And, and that's what you still think. And we still feel that way. And frankly, if it changes, um, you're going to compromise the economics of an awful lot of radio in this country, and I think that's a mistake. Are, are you, is your industry satisfied with the rate of HD radio adoption? Oh, it can always be faster. Um, What's the impediment, you think? Uh, I think just uh, uh, getting it into more new cars, getting people familiar with it. But HD radio would be like the, the different sound quality of a FM station going to a cassette player. It's just brighter. It's clearer. It's, it's just a new technology to, to give the, the consumer a better radio experience. So deals with the auto manufacturers is the key. It's one of the keys, and it's getting HD radio and more devices, uh, even our laptops, in the future. Thank you so much for being here this week. We appreciate it. Thank you. John, thank you as thank well. You.